Okay, sir. Shall we start? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Good afternoon, one and all. I heartily welcome all of you in the sequel of historical and pioneering Langley's online lecture series. At the outset, we, the team of Langley, need to thank all the participants for your unconditional love, words of appreciations, blessings, academic support, and overwhelming response. Most of us are the part of this historical journey, started well back on 20th April 2020, and now we have reached to the milestone by conducting more than 51 sessions of well-known national and international academicians uh, who have delivered their scholarly talks on various aspects of language, literature, criticism, ICT, e-content. and the uh, effects of uh, covid-19 on higher education and so on as active participants and regular attenders proves that you have quest for knowledge in this pandemic period uh, situation too even though we are locked down we are not down language platform provided uh, one of its kind in mutual teaching learning experience it's a uh, free to learn from the expert no registration required and that's why reached to 40000 views on youtube channel till today and more than 1000 english professors teachers and more importantly students and research scholars are benefited by this lecture series in addition to that is not the end of lecture series it suggests a new beginning we will arrange such lecture series national and international Uh, level webinars as per the availability of uh, international acclaimed speakers every now and then friends today we have with us a well known nationally acclaimed academicians dr deep kumar trivedi sir associate professor of english at uh, indian institute of uh, teacher education gandhinagar uh, gujarat and dr anand kulkarni sir associate professor and head pg department of english narayan gaon pune maharashtra uh, let me introduce both the speaker first then uh, then dr deep kumar trivedi sir will speak first followed by dr anand kulkarni sir dr deep kumar trivedi sir is associate professor of english at uh, indian institute of teacher education gandhinagar he has a total number of 30 publications including Six uh, books, uh, book publications. Two of the uh, two of his books are well listed as reference books on the uh, syllabus of uh, Maharshi Dayanand University, uh, Rohtak and uh, Sardar Patel University, Vallabh Vidyanagar, respectively. His areas of uh, research and major interest include contemporary literary and cultural theory, as well as communication skills. Dr. Trivedi. is a resource person at UGC HRDC Gujarat University's online refresher course on ELT he prepared and delivered a teaching speaking module online through swayam portal four students have been awarded the degree of phd under his supervision friends today we have also with us dr arun kulkarni sir he is head an associate professor post graduate department of english at arts commerce and science college narayan gaon pune he has 22 years of a teaching experience at ug and pg level his areas of uh, uh, research and major interest include literary theory and criticism he has completed minor research project of a uh, of a ugc on indian students and post structural theories negotiations and supervisions in 2013 he is the recognized research guide in english of uh, mphil and phd of savitribai phule pune university and there are eight uh, research students awarded phd degree in english by savitribai phule pune university and five research students awarded mphil degree in english by savitribai phule pune university under his able guidance he has edited two books entitled a pathway uh, to success and glimpses of prose and poetry he has written a book entitled an introduction to literary theory and criticism 
published by Orient Black Swan in two thousand fifteen. So, without further delay, uh, as we can see, the webinar room is almost full uh, by the enthusiastic participants and quest for knowledge learners. Let me invite uh, Dr. Deep Kumar Trivedi, sir. Associate Professor of English at Indian Institute of Teacher Education, Gandhi Nagar, to deliver his talk on Shakespeare's Hamlet, the theory, the history, the anthropology, and the theatre. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Moteji. Uh, Langlet and the entire team seems to be fueling a lot these days, uh, helping all the learners progress continuously. And uh, this calls for a genuine recognition in every sense. Uh, if you remember, perhaps uh, we have had that interaction that whether to go for V.S. Naipaul or Hamlet, and you you somehow fortunately clubbed two very interesting dialogues within one particular box of uh, di interaction. Uh, well, talking about Hamlet is something that would go ahead with hardcore aspect of learning literature, there is no doubt about it. Uh, but apart from being a literary text, uh, I believe that there are many other, you know, references to it, which confirm that the text was not ordinarily drafted. And uh, I, I, I would try to bring about those details, uh, which may sound extraneous to the text, but heavily present within the context of the dialogues that appear within the text. So with your kind permission, I would uh, begin to share uh, the screen. Should I? Yes, sir. yes, sir. Right. I believe my screen is visible. Yes, sir. As I uh, decided to go ahead with these references, the history, the anthropology, and of course the theater, I do wish to bring about some of the basics that are revealed, well revealed through the text. And going further, uh, I would start with the very opening of the drama. Uh, my major focus is on opening of the drama uh, because the end definitely complements to it well. Uh, there is a kind of gloom in the environment. If you see the very opening of the drama, you can imagine the very stage wherein there are, there are soldiers and the soldiers are somewhere amidst a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of eerie environment, which they are unable to actually predict. And the soldiers are out on the battlements they are on duty actually, and they are cold. They are miserable because of few events which have occurred subsequently during the drama. And they are frightened as well because they, they, they feel that there is something going to happen to them and something very notorious they are expecting. So uh, you have those two soldiers well posted on duty and uh, there is a kind of, you can say, unsure environment prevailing. At the stage circumstances, we can, we can start imagining that the soldiers, they are expecting something notorious to happen. And sure enough, they are, that something uh, does happen actually in the drama, wherein something terrible appears. Now, what appears as terrible is a dead man, or you can say uh, a spirit or a ghost, maybe maybe some, some goblin, we do not know. So with the note of unsurety, the text begins, the drama begins. And this opening is significantly presented because that is the rare instance with the rest of the plays of Shakespeare. And uh, of course he did attempt one into one of his historical dramas, but then, but then that again wasn't that much to uh, eerie. This is something different. This environment is comparatively eerie and uh, mysterious. There is enough fog in the environment and these two are concerned that what would happen? 
and this opening turn significant because it 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 leads us to further dialogue uh, with reference to history as well history of england and who is the person there what spirit is there or what ghost or goblin is visible to them is somebody who appears like the dead king the dead king that is hamlet himself not the prince but the old hamlet and it seems to be posing some trouble uh, because uh, why does the ghost appear now and why is it appearing to these soldiers uh, well posted on the battlements so what is he doing there and what does he pose actually is that a problem for the characters within the drama or eventually trying to bring a kind of pose for his son as we can predict moving further it gives us a thought that this is more of a kind of theatrical build up that shakespeare is trying to offer to the audience i am using the word audience in particular because uh, the drama has everything to do with performance rather than the only reading experience and i think we are going to take up the matter to even texts the many versions of the text that shakespeare has been seen so far across these 400 years so this is a kind of eerie moment as as we we just talked about and uh, the soldiers uh, they have twice before seeing a spectral appearance on the battlements of elsino and uh, this is explaining you know a lot to the audience that something notorious is going to happen so these two they reported to horatio who is comparatively someone who understands the situation well and horatio is a scholar who is skeptical about the story of the ghost he believes that these two are unnecessarily frightened and uh, there may not be any ghost so assure he confirms that it will not appear he says within the text it will not appear and then the ghost appears astonishing them all and terrifying the scholar also who is enough skeptical about the very presence of the ghost who passes instantly from skepticism to horror so there is a shift right in the beginning where horatio uh, is is taken up with uh, enough of surprise and what happens and what happens further uh, to his testing because he is skeptical he is trying to test whether the spirit is there or not or is it some kind of uh, so called phobia or maybe some kind of craft that is troubling to them so he says that i'll i'll stand in the way i'll cross it i'll cross it and i'll walk across the path of the ghost uh, but also i'll i'll perhaps hold my arms out like a cross to try to protect myself now this one takes us to christian reference uh, as if to make the posture of a cross so that the the ghost doesn't harm uh, horatio horatio does indeed ask the ghost uh, the set of questions because he is a scholar as we know and he is asking multiple questions to the ghost in a particular manner again you know there is a series of questions that he proposes and uh, for a very long time he had worked out on such kind of routine that what if he happens to encounter a ghost would be would he be questioning so he he does dare and there is nothing wrong when he dares but then he doesn't get response you see the ghost does not respond Uh, to uh, either horatio or to the anyone present around so these appearances of the ghost are a theatrical build up according to me and one of the most remarkable that shakespeare had ever achieved toward the ultimate appearance of the ghost in the act itself to hamlet himself who has been brought now onto the battlements with the soldiers and with his friend horatio to see if the ghost will appear so now the matter is taken to the person expected prince hamlet and uh, it is expected that the ghost might interact with his son they do understand that the appearance of the ghost is definitely that of uh, the late king but then 
still there is a room. If we bring in Hamlet, there may be a possible interaction between the spirit of late father and the son. And uh, the earlier reference moves on to further development. So what happens is that there is an interaction between Hamlet as he is brought to the battlements. He is well briefed by Horatio that uh, you need to be careful, sir. There may be a possibility wherein, uh, wherein the ghost could be a kind of trick to harm you. It may lead you into something very, uh, you know, very much notorious, uh, you know, propaganda of some kind. It, it should not harm you. So better you don't follow the ghost. But Hamlet is damn curious to get to know whether the ghost has something to say to me or not. And of course, there is a concern of a son that why would the spirit of my father appear now? It's already a mourning period. So the ghost is approaching during the time when mourning is, is observed. The sun is there. So they are all afraid that there could be a kind of trick. They are afraid that this might be uh, some kind of uh, a demon luring Hamlet onto the battlements where he could throw himself to his death in an act of suicidal mania. And Hamlet is armed and tells his friends that they must not stop him. He says, I'll make a ghost of him that attempts to stop me. So he's, he's, he's curious, he's rigorous. He is actually willing to interact with the, the spirit that has suddenly appeared to, uh, to their battlements. And this curiosity has many good reasons to consider. A son curious to talk uh, with his father's spirit uh, the timing of the appearance of the ghost is also interestingly posed. So we know that though Hamlet has said, I'll call the, uh, the further interaction uh, between the characters that reveals to us that they are not exactly sure. Even Hamlet himself is not sure whether this ghost uh, is, is, is actually some good spirit or some goblin. There is a constant doubt prevailing, even in the mind of Hamlet. So uh, while even addressing the ghost or while addressing the very spirit, Hamlet uh, says that I'll call thee Hamlet, king, father, royal den, I'll call thee, I'll decide to call thee, I will treat you as if you are actually what you look like you are. Hamlet, my father, the king, the king of Denmark, and I will follow you. And I want you to not let me burst, he says, in ignorance, but tell me why you are here. So the very dialogue itself reveals that uh, Hamlet doesn't seem to be absolutely sure whether the, uh, the ghost is actually the spirit of his father. It's, it's completely doomed kind of an environment wherein uh, it's hard to predict. And uh, the first revelation of the ghost uh, is, is nothing but a kind of combination where he's coming from and is, is, is trying to tell whether, he's, whether the ghost is coming from a particular place uh, or, and, and is trying to also convey uh, who murdered him, uh, says to Hamlet uh, while leaving the very scene says, uh, adieu, adieu, remember me, remember me. These, you know, twice references to remember me, remember me uh, are significant. If we try to understand why a ghost would say, remember me, it's not just about revenge. It's more about remembering that the ghost is trying to convey here. And, uh, we move forward. I, I've recollected several things from uh, several many uh, traces that I could figure out, and that through a formal study also. That uh, the old story was from a Danish chronicle, uh, which belongs to the 12th or 13th century, rather. And uh, later it was adapted by a French writer named Belfast. Uh, Shakespeare 
perhaps got it from the French version, I believe, because uh, somehow the story of uh, the Danish Chronicle is rather too open in terms of revelation. There is hardly any suspense. It's more of revenge and bloodshed. The direct references are uh, not related to anything that is mystery or some, some kind of eerie environment or something like that. It directly talks about the murder that takes place in open. So Danish reference has open murder reference, uh, which takes place in some kind of marketplace. And the Shakespearean version, if we see, the Danish version also was uh, named different. That was Amleth. So there is a kind of, you can say, complete disconnect. But yes, Shakespeare was fond of borrowing plots from uh, even the past and of course from his contemporaries. Uh, he did beautify them with his own sense of original reproduction. So he did reproduce a lot of content in his own manner. So later followed by, uh, you know, the, 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 the very French reference, I, I, I would try to put it this way, that Shakespeare's version of the play is, is not exactly an open murder. There is a secret. The son, Hamlet, does not begin the play knowing that he is an avenger in everyone's, everyone's mind. It's concealed if we try to see it. Only Hamlet knows now after the interaction that takes place between him and his father that I am to avenge the death of my father. Whereas in the Danish reference, it was more like everyone knew that once the child grows up, we'll have to take the revenge. So everyone knows that the person is going to get involved into some kind of revenge as if it was a tradition of the time. Whereas here, there is some secrecy there is mystery and whatever takes place in terms of interaction between the father and the son Hamlet, it's, it's more concealed that remains within themselves. So it's, it's, it's a secret story that begins with uh, only Hamlet knowing that my father was murdered and uh, murdered with, uh, with, you can say, a very confidential reference. So, and out of that difference, Shakespeare construct, uh, he constructs a profoundly different plot or a play, starting with the fact that in the old story, the Danish story, the principal problem faced by the young boy is how am I going to survive? Whereas here, this is not the point. How would I take revenge is something that takes place within the mind of Shakespeare. So the first reference had issues of survival, whereas here, the reference is of a different kind wherein the, the character has to decide with what means and how the character is going to take revenge. Shakespeare throughout his career didn't invent much, of course, uh, as we have been reading through several theories and you know a lot of criticism has taken place so far. And uh, one of his contemporaries, rather a fond enemy, also said that he was an upstart crow beautified with our feathers. So he has stolen enough from our content in terms of plot. And that description was not exactly wrong or inaccurate in a way that Shakespeare loved to take other people's feathers and did war them. But then he certainly beautified them with his own sense of reconstruction. In Shakespeare's story, uh, what happens is there is a grown-up son, an educated man he is, uh, whom everyone would expect to be an avenger, except that no one knows that there has been a murder. So others do not know that there was a murder of the late king, except the son. And also the son is an educated man. So of course, the audiences would be curious to see how exactly uh, Hamlet happens to proceed further. Uh, that's the crucial difference between the two texts. This is what I briefly wanted to bring to the notice of the audience that there are versions of Hamlet's, uh, you know, uh, historical references occurred previously. Uh, if, we, if we move ahead, uh, then there is a question. One of the key question uh, that comes into context says that uh, 
I'm sorry. Seems there is some disturbance. Uh, no, sir. We can continue. Right. Uh, there are many other things which I have incorporated. Let me uh, go back to my previous slide. Uh, so there is a question, and the question confirms many things. And that is where the actual uh, beginning starts, that the key question is related to production of Hamlet, which has to grapple with its basic problems or tendencies of the course of action. Where does the ghost come from? How did it happen to appear? What does he carry with him? Is it a message or some intention? What, what exactly is it? What is the purpose? As it were, back into our world, reaching back to the world of the alive, uh, was it feasible then? Why did Shakespeare incorporate this technique? Usually we teach uh, in this manner to the classroom that it was a technique adapted by Shakespeare. There's no doubt about it that it was a technique to con confirm and make sure that the, the houses or theaters, they are flooded with audience because that experiment did work during those days. So of course it was a technique, but then did it have any concealed reference to the history or anthropology of the time or religion? That's what we will see uh, further. So, it also says what extraterrestrial, was there any other extraterrestrial space kind of thing then? And if it was there, uh, how would it, would it be identified? That, that turns out to be a significant question because if there is a ghost, of course the ghost is not alive. And if the ghost is not alive, what is it doing in the world of the alive? So that takes us to that curiosity. Is the spirit of health, is that a goblin? Uh, as Hamlet puts it with sense of curiosity, which must mean a spirit from purgatory. Then that takes us to further questioning that what is a purgatory? Because then it will you know, ask us to refer to even historical documentation related to purgatory. That we'll discuss further in the coming slides. Uh, so the immediate problem is for the director who is actually dealing with the production house that whether it will be feasible to present a ghost on the stage because the theater then did not have anything as uh, technology to you know bring about some kind of effect that can uh, you know that can bring into context the feeling of being uh, uh, within the scene so the audiences would expect some something to happen some sparkles maybe some lights from here and there, because the earlier theaters certainly didn't have those, those lighting effects or something like that. So carrying out the text in terms of performance must have been a, a difficult job for uh, those who were actually related to production houses. The way we have many uh, web series and serials going on these days, uh, the only job for the productions are production houses were to deal with those scripts in most convenient and effective manners. And Hamlet was a challenge then because they had to present a ghost on the stage and that also in a very convincing manner. Otherwise, the audiences would reject them immediately. So, of course, uh, that also leads us to another reference that is Catholic belief. Uh, so, were there believers of Catholicism then? Because Protestant, Protestant Protestantism was actually uh, growing very fast uh, during, the during that particular time. Of course, Shakespeare was a born Catholic, perhaps uh, might have adopted even Protestantism in the later stage, but then he was born of a Catholic family, later turning into uh, the Protestants. The belief is still prominent in the drama after 50 years of, uh, you can say, exercise, you see that Catholic believers are there and there was an entire system made sense and allowed the possibility of an ongoing relationship with their date. And in fact, for a kind of planning for their own post-mortem life, as if the ghosts, they come and tell what is happening to them. This is interesting if uh, for somebody who is trying to do research into uh, 
the role of the ghost or spirit within the drama that did it have anything to do with catholicism or not and uh, moving further uh, we have the protestantism reacting to it it says that you know they they took up the entire system apart uh, from the earlier catholicism in the wake of the reformation uh it 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 left many people many men and women in england without any emotionally viable relationship to the afterlife the concept of afterlife was completely rejected by uh, those uh, believers of protestantism and they did it aggressively confirming that no catholic traces they remain there whereas catholicism did promote this idea uh through even uh, those those handwritten copies they are exclusively called some documents that also we will bring into dialogue uh it's it's exclusive content so i'll i'll just uh, bring it to the later stage of discussion and there is a peculiar line uh, within the text which says uh, it's it's uttered by the ghost that says unhouseled disappointed unannulled from the ghost speech to hamlet which says you would have discovered that those words had a particular theological meaning that by now has dropped away disappeared which makes the line hard to understand why does he use these phrases unhouseled disappointed unannulled and do they have any references to theology as well so if you see by the meaning itself it says uh, unhousel the word unhousel which meant communion so you have to go back to the community itself the people there in england uh, the eucharist you know that reference is taken up so household meaning not to have received the eucharist a kind of proceeding they must have performed uh, during those days annulled meant uh, it it meant anointed with holy oil so this is adding further to the idea of uh, some kind of practice they may be performing is was there something like holy oil that they may be you know using once somebody is dies and unannulled meant you didn't have that right of the oil which says that the 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 person was not obliged to those uh, those duties once the person is dead right and disappointed covered all the other rights of appointment when you were facing death that is confession and absolution so i believe these words are strikingly important and even uh, planning to do uh, further studies into this can certainly come across many more revelations Uh, due to constraint of limitation of time i'm i'm, I'm summarizing uh, this summarizing this little quick so what is purgatory the place that i talked about earlier that from where did the ghost appeared the word is referred to as purgatory and what is purgatory uh, is 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 interesting to find uh, it was a middle space between heaven and the hell that for a very long time the the church the catholic church said was the place in which many souls most souls as they used to claim uh they those who were not condemned to be tortured for an eternity in hell those who were not fortunate enough to even get through the pious gates of heaven immediately they have to stay somewhere a kind of middle space between this earth and of course uh, the the space somewhere either in hell or heaven so the space remains in between is addressed as purgatory so does the ghost come from purgatory because hamlet's father the spirit itself says that uh, you don't know what i am i'm i'm passing through All right i am in tremendous pain this is what his dialogues reveal i am just paraphrasing what the spirit of the late hamlet says so if you talk about purgatory that that there must be some specific reference to the catholic belief uh, in the times of protestantism uh, the way it prevailed of 
course, there was a change. Uh, the belief was proposed by Catholics. No one underestimated uh, the ex excruciating pain in purgatory. People did have a strong belief that the soul must be undergoing tremendous pain. The soul must have been through many several tortures before it reaches to either the hell or the heaven. And purgatory is treated as something, uh, something very notorious that no one would want to be at. So that place is, is the placement of the soul is, is, is terrible. And this was the Catholic Christian belief then. And this is what the, the Protestants tried to bring in the form of change because they wanted to abolish almost everything that was Catholic in terms of treatment. So, uh, but it was only temporary. That, that pain was temporary till the time you are not promoted either to hell or the heaven. You, you have to stay in the, the, in the purgatory. And uh, that, that was for a certain term. That was for a specific period of time that the soul will have to rest or tortured. Uh, heaven was, uh, of course, an eternity. But the trouble with this is that actually England in the middle of the 16th century was already going through what uh, one would term as cultural, or maybe a cultural historian would call it a cultural revolution, uh, which certain key beliefs of Roman Catholicism had been outlawed or literally forbidden by the uh, by the you know the new ones or the new parties to emerge and that did have uh, a strong hold on English society so uh, what you have by uh, the non catholics was a strong you know a strong hand was used to confirm that the people should not believe in the idea of afterlife as there is nothing like afterlife. They, they were also using dust. Once, once the person dies, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll use dust, confirming that, all right, now the matter is over. The dead body is, is, is something that rests in peace. Now the matter ends. And you don't have to think about anything or you don't have to imagine anything after life. So they clearly denied anything. You know, the Protestants, they literally denied that there is nothing like afterlife. And the Catholics, they, they maintain some gateway in the form of uh, purgatory. So they are dead and awaiting the last judgment and either resurrection or damnation because there is no middle space for souls, no purgatory. This is what the Protestants with a very strong emphasis tried to stress and uh, bring into law also. The Protestant church officials argued that purgatory was a fraud. Uh, they used a very, uh, a very harsh term. They said that this was a fraud, a confidence racket designed to extract money from the faithful, the people who abided uh, Catholicism with complete faith, they, they cheated upon and they forbade believers from observing as they had to they had for centuries, the rituals and the acts of charity and the prayers and the exchanges involved in, the, in feeling that they had, they were still in a relationship, uh, an active relationship to their dead people. So Protestants were, uh, were very much strict in their application to their idea that there is nothing like purgatory and there is nothing like afterlife. Shakespeare is writing this play, uh, Hamlet, about after 50 years. And these momentous changes, uh, what you see is there is a question. What have the 50 years done to the English men and women who saw Hamlet? What has changed? Have they ceased to believe because the government has said that they can no longer believe? Do people act that way, actually? Do they cease to believe in their relationship to the date? It's not a switch that can be turned on and off so easily. Because there is a question to their very idea of faith, to their very idea of uh, their very involvement so far 
for almost not less than 200, 300, four years of their engagement with Catholicism, uh, if, if there is a sudden impose by the Protestants that forget about something like purgatory, don't even mention the idea of afterlife, and then Shakespeare brings in the spirit on the stage. So if anything goes on the stage, consider that it is recognized within that society. This is what we are trying to discuss right now, that he doesn't bring in the ghost uh, with any anything abstract or anything abnormal. He brings in the ghost with some motive, with some belief that yes, the larger mass or the people did believe in something that we call afterlife. And this is what the text confirms. The thing or the practice or the document that we call, uh, where the, the documents were called indulgences. There is a special word used for these documents and they are known as indulgences. And what are these indulgences? They are basically printed copies. All right, they are printed documents uh, done in the late 15th centuries and early in the 16th centuries. With these documents, uh, the Catholics, the way they have proposed, they were the grants of time off, some kind of relaxation, or maybe some coupon kind of things, or some kind of, you can say, receipts they were issuing to the believers of Catholicism that, that you can have this paper, and during your dear one's stay in purgatory, the soul's rest in purgatory, the person will be at ease. There will be less harm or torture uh, to the soul in the purgatory. So they were known as indulgences, ticket or coupon kind of things. And they were, uh, they were almost of the size of A4 size of paper, maybe parted in two. But then they, they were issued in print form that people can have relaxation when their souls rest in purgatory. Uh, so what they would do is, uh, you know, you, you can acquire these indulgences in exchange for donations. So in a way, you are paying for those, uh, those indulgences. You, you pay to the church and the church will issue those uh, indulgences. And sometimes, uh, maybe even for years or maybe for, you know, for decades, uh, your agonizing punishment in purgatory is... Uh, is, is, is freed from, uh, that's, that's where uh, the soul can rest in peace. There is no torture. So they confirm some kind of ticket uh, in the form of indulgences. The Catholic Church of the late Middle Ages had developed an elaborate system to govern and to control the relationship between the living and the dead. So there was a system. If you understand, uh, this is what the English have done so far. They have systemized even the idea of education. So we, 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 we learn things, but then in a particular system, we learn things. And Hamlet is, is no uh, excuse in this regard that this text also comes into the same scanner of learning. Uh, it, it represents or it documents or it, it talks about those existing or prevailing systems. And if you go by theological view further, uh, it, it talks about the very central problem of the drama that, that no ghost from purgatory in the old system could ever have said, avenge my foul and unnatural murder because the Bible says explicitly that vengeance is mine saith, the Lord that God expects vengeance. The Bible is explicitly against vendettas and vengeance. But this is not a theological tract. We should understand that this is a drama. It's a play, Hamlet, that we are talking about. So it, it might have few uh, references to biblical you know, understanding. But then clearly, the appearance of the ghost uh, says that, avenge my death. Now, this is something that doesn't uh, get endorsed by Bible. All right, so it also confirms that Shakespeare perhaps was not exactly uh, a strict believer in religion. He, he did play with things 
as we all know he never obliged to those uh, classical norms of dealing with literature he did play with uh, many rules and regulations which were proposed by classical pattern of writing and reading another interesting document that we can refer to uh, with reference to the time that we are talking about is the bills of mortality if you visit any of uh, municipal you know records of london or maybe elsewhere across in england uh, they have preserved many such documents wherein uh, they would keep a record of they will keep an account of rather than record they will keep an account of uh, the number of deaths within a week uh, that that would take place in their society and that record will also have the details of the cause of death something interesting happens with shakespeare is that shakespeare's deaths or shakespeare's references to death are unlike what used to take place in the times when he when he was writing uh, there were there, there is no reference to plague there is no reference to uh, those uh, issues like uh, diarrhea or any other disease that would become that would become the very or, or any of the medicinal you know uh, reasons of death he doesn't bring in he brings into context something that comes from within so he talks about the death that comes from within you know uh, that comes through character it doesn't come through something that we call uh, a very literal biological reference he he brings in the context uh, something that comes through characters within the text so here uh, there is a murder and the murder is a result of some conspiracy uh, right so that way the text becomes very interesting uh, he doesn't talk about disease or misfortunes that the people encounter during those days he rather goes ahead with something that that turns out to be the casualty of some conspiracy a murder and that's why probably he he brings into context those uh, those characters who are basically from a different class that can be idealized uh, to the society well there is something uh, very interesting that i could find related to manuscript if you go by the historical traces of the text uh, there are no manuscripts that survive for any of the plays of shakespeare that we have in the editions of shakespeare in the folio or even in the quarto uh, they must have been thrown away or worked to death and fell into tatters or burnt up or drowned up we we exactly do not have any reasons of what could have uh, caused the loss of those manuscripts that we consider as final or original even the oxford premises do not have uh, those actual manuscripts or the uh, manuscripts which we can claim that this was written this is the original hamlet or the only hamlet that survives as final that's not possible that's not feasible because the manuscripts have been damaged by one or the other means and uh, we simply don't have any of them if, if i conclude by saying so uh, so some of the most fascinating ones are in hamlet uh, and there are hundreds of such scripts i tell you uh, there are many manuscripts because as i said earlier uh, the production houses they used to compete like like anything often it has been observed that the drama is within performance the drama is actually on going in the theater and while the drama is being performed outside uh, some different versions of the same drama in the form of script will be sold and they are usually cheaper copies and uh, and those copies do not have exact phrasing the manuscripts have complete contrasts uh if if you check them and there are hundreds of such manuscripts so you can't say that the manuscripts that we have we are teaching in in, in india or maybe elsewhere uh, they are the only manuscripts that can be claimed as uh, as final 
right? Uh, but then we are trying to learn through the best we have. What do we have here is uh, is something uh, very simple to understand that one uh, was published in the quarto format uh, as far as Hamlet is concerned. I am referring to one was published in the quarto format in uh, 1604 and 1605. Later on, it was reprinted even in 1611. But then there is tremendous verbal variant if you see even the folio version. So you have two different versions, quarto format, and then the other version in folio version. Uh, there is a, there is a verbal you know variant that I have tried to bring in for our immediate you know reflection. Uh, in folio version, there is a dialogue which says, "Oh, that this too." Two solid flesh would melt thou and dissolve itself into a dew. And if we turn to the quarto version, here is what we discover. Oh, that is too, too solid. It doesn't say solid. It says solid flesh would melt. So there is a verbal distinction between the two scripts that we have regarding the very text Hamlet. And this doesn't happen with Hamlet only. Trust me, this is found in almost all the manuscripts of uh, of Shakespearean uh, plays. Uh, there will be either one or the other kind of, you can say, distinction in, in the phrasing or maybe uh, typing uh, of the manuscripts. And it is something that changes the very meaning. You see, when, 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 you, when you replace or edit or when you put in even a little alphabetical change, it takes us to altogether a different meaning. So the folio version seems to say that Hamlet thinks that his flash is too substantial, too solid, and it should change its form to liquid. Whereas this one, the later one says the word salad in quattro, salad means something like assailed or besieged. Now, through this one small example, uh, we can understand that even the manuscripts uh, as the historical documents, you, you, you don't find them as final. And there are several versions, hundreds of versions of Hamlet, uh, very much current in use. Uh, but then, I'm sorry to say, but you can't say that this is the only version or final version that can be considered as the one which was written by Shakespeare. And uh, this, this, this all I recollected on the basis of a very uh, composed study uh, I had in the recent past. Uh, but then uh, one more thing I wish to add here is the role of print media, which is not there in the, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation right now. Just I'm concluding my remarks by, by stating that that if you talk about print media, even printing press facility during those days uh, did come with uh, uh, different alphabetical orders. And that also might have caused a little bit of a change in those uh, phrasing or typological errors, we may even call them. But then that takes place due to the printing awareness or some kind of, you can say, the instruments which they were using, or intentionally they were replacing those sounds. We all do know that homophones and homonyms can also, uh, you know, change the very context of the text. So, deliberately, uh, also many printing press people they 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 used alphabets, justifying different sounds, and this is where Hamlet turns out to be. Uh, a very exclusive case because uh, it has uh, immediate historical, anthropological, and also uh, performance related changes. Theater as a production house did compete uh, with a tremendous force during those days. There were people involved in uh, 
in, in printing. There were people involved in uh, selling tickets. There were people who were more interested in having their share of entertainment because there were not too many options available for, uh, for their entertainment purpose. And not even everyone was rich to buy those uh, authentic uh, texts that would come through some printing facility. So many would purchase those cheaper copies which would be uh, in cell just outside the premise of the theater. The, we, we, we black the tickets uh, or we used to black the tickets. Perhaps that has become the past tense. So uh, that was all from my side. Uh, this is what I have recollected. Uh, I'll be happy if, if anyone has questions or, or some inputs to share. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mote. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, sir uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We will have Q and A session at the end of the the session after. Dr. Can we complete it on time? Or yes, 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 yes. Right. No problem. Uh, yeah. We will have Q and A session at the end of this uh, search talk. That's Participants, uh, I can see the webinar room is almost full. Are requested to post their queries in Q and A box, not in chat box. Okay, so. Now may I invite Dr. Anand Kulkarni, sir, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, Narangao, Pune, uh, to deliver his talk on criticism, contra theory, mapping the field and speculating its future. Over to you, sir. Okay. You can hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I request uh, Deep Kumar, uh, sir, to stop his share slides. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Now you can share your slides. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Prashant, Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yes. Go ahead, um, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Prashant, Professor, for giving this opportunity to share my views on the review. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, my co-panelist, Dr. Trivedi, sir, for uh, making a wonderful journey into the theatrical world of Hamlet. Uh, and I was reminded of the word that you used, you know, the word called purgatory. So uh, dealing with criticism and theory is always like a purgatory, you know, that you are not in between. You are in between and you are not either in hell or in heaven, more so in hell. Anyway, uh, scholars, teachers and students, uh, I'm happy that uh, we have these kinds of uh, sessions and special thanks to Dr. Prashant Modi for uh, uh, energizing students and teachers in this period of uh, crisis that we are going through. Hope that we shall come out of this purgatory as well and we shall land into heaven as well. So it's a choiceless choice anyway. And criticism happens to be a choiceless choice. We have to do with that because we are dealing with literature. We have to deal with criticism, the tools that we have to follow. And these tools, the approaches uh, that help us in knowing literature, the beauties, the aesthetics, the frame, the content, the form, everything that literary studies uh, covers. Anyway, I don't think because the title uh, runs too long and uh, it has a big, vast range, I won't be able to cover within a short span of time, but I'll try to touch upon certain issues which I believe are significant in understanding the journey of the trajectory of literary criticism. Here. Uh, I deliberately use the word criticism contra theory because that I think is self-suggestive, self-explanatory in the sense that uh, theory rose as a resistance to the established norms in uh, criticism that we all know. I need not uh, repeat those things, but I should really start with because that I think should uh, be considered as a point of reference if we want to discuss criticism. Uh, in the 20th century, it should be new criticism. So, you know, there was a change from author to the text, and there was a change from the self open ended, sociologically, moral, uh, moral point of view, or historically, culturally, everything that was being looked into by the scholars and teachers earlier that was being forbidden by the new critics. So, new critics were new, at least in this approach of uh, confining literature, literary works to texts, what later on Barthes uh, called it to be text, you know. 
so we we shall come to that if time permits but then this was a move away from the traditional focus on author to the modern focus on, on text so texts turned to be autotelic by that i mean texts uh, were supposed to be self contained they did not uh, need any kind of extra textual reference for their meaning to be understood but then meaning was there you know the one point that new critics did not shy away from or did not run away from was this that they were more interested in meaning the only thing was this that they reduced the focus of trying to understand the meaning from the world to the text yeah if i am not wrong you know this is the right time also to refer to edward says who wrote a wonderful book by the title the word the text and the critic in which he tries to interpret text as a worldly construction which the new critics were not interested in so you have these two very uh, very broad categorizations very broad uh, currents movements in literary studies one was that which focused on text which right now i am talking about the other one was the marxist the sociological the moral the cultural the political and all those things uh, we the practitioners of which always considered always always took literary literature to be an open ended and always uh, ready to interpret with the help of uh, extra textual contexts so you shall see that new criticism uh, can be safely understood as a turning point a departure from the conventional uh, literary criticism and this departure was from the the writer towards the text from the world towards the text from everything that was out of the text was brought into the text and text was thought to be was considered to be was put forth as something which contained everything and need and needed nothing uh, from anything so extraneous was not allowed that is the point from there on we move towards the theory you know and it is where uh, i have to run so fast because we are running short of time and i have to cover so many other things as well uh so you shall see ki that theory emerged as a you can say in a way a resistance also but you can also say that in a way it was a continuation also in a revised form though theory has often be, been understood as a radicalization of a subversion of or what you call a serious challenge given to literary studies or the prevalent critical practices critical approaches still i believe that there is a, even though a very small kind of strand but it runs and it is this that theory was also a kind of revision uh, of the critical tools of the critical approaches that uh, the uh, the the critics before theory were practicing you know so that way we have to understand it so that uh, we will be in a position to understand why even in 2000 in the 21st century theory thrives despite there have been serious attempts even on the parts of the theorists to announce that theory is dead even eagleton announced he wrote a book a big book and which became very popular as well where he announced that the theory is dead so you shall see that there is a uh, big canvas on which we can understand how uh, criticism has continued uh, to resurface in different forms of course theory is one of the forms that we have to understand though in a resisting form but then you shall see that the entire history of criticism is like raising questions and not providing answers that is what theory has done and so it has tried to problematize it has tried to raise questions it has tried to confuse it has tried to uh, it has tried to uh, bring in so many issues which the text probably would not allow to bring in so you shall see that there is a change from author to the text and from the text now on to the reader so this kind of trajectory is there i i should not use the word trajectory because it has a, a specified way of uh, route you know a specified journey course of action. but then uh, to use that word we can say that uh, it has moved this way branching off in different fields in different areas which and then with theory with the rise of theory you shall see the proper power base of literature which was supposed to be literariness you know the word that roman ecopson earlier used a structuralist in the real sense of the term but unfortunately was not given the credit that he should have should have been given barnes was given others were given but jacobson was not so in the word to use the word jacobson uh, used literariness in literature was being challenged 
the disciplinarity of literature was being challenged the boundary that was drawn around the literary text was also challenged so there were so many new things which thing uh, ideas and notions which were brought into and the change was from now the text was important but the reader was also important so there was a change you know the writers uh, the writers authority with bats announcing to the world that the writer is dead and bats was not the first to say so you know earlier it was uh, fetish itch also who did the same thing announcing to the world that the god is dead so you can look upon uh, fetish straight to be the forefather of uh, critical theory that bloomed in 1970s and 80s in france especially so you can see ke that there was a change from uh, new critical approach which was methodological more of methodological less of uh, theoretical more of uh, pedagogical and less of political kind of thing and then you shall see that there was a change from new critical to these kinds of areas where uh, where social sciences most of the social sciences including philosophy and humanities entered into the presence which was codified and enshrined by the earlier critics uh, for literary studies it was being encroached upon you have uh, some of the sanest voices i am using this word you know very specifically there are the sanest voices like mh abrams who raised some of the vital points about the efficacy and usefulness of uh, critical theories so that is that they were being encroached upon the the areas which were supposed to be the enshrined areas were being challenged for example uh, interpretation was being challenged for example the meaningfulness of uh, language was being challenged the very idea of language was being redefined and in a way radicalized they did that did it in a very uh, in a very mass on a very massive scale you know there was a total uh, refurbishment of language that these may, may uh, i request uh, kulkarni sir to share his slide yeah please yes thank you <laughs> this has, this happens with uh, teachers often yes sir it's okay uh, we need to go to the folder section yes yeah yeah i will ah huh, this helps yes sir it is visible now prashant yes 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 sir uh, kindly maximize maximize yeah 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 no no besides that it's okay uh, you can see it yes yes uh, the client kindly click double click on it okay you can see it now no no sir yes 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 okay go ahead fine Uh, this is how we have started with you know and yes. we were discussing that there is a change from criticism to theory you shall go to the next uh, slide you have this in, in a very synoptic form you shall see uh, mapping the field is going to be having a kind of survey you know and it's, it's a very broad kind of thing we may not be able to cover up everything uh, in this given period of time but you shall see there is, there is a change i have fixed i have taken new criticism as a point of reference from where we have to go on and then the focus is as i earlier discussed not on the author but on the text literature has closed at all telling that is having its own end actually literature was supposed to have the end of giving message to the people for example if you go towards the sociological i do not directly say the marxist but anyway to the sociological approaches you should see that literature was some kind of say that was being changed by uh, the new critics so you can call new critics to be the first trouble trouble makers in the literary studies you know in the given sense of the term because they tried to professionalize the study of literature that was what they tried to do you know so you have this uh, insulated from ideology that is one very important thing that we have to understand ideology was barred it was not being entertained new critics were not interested in ideology probably because they thought that text itself is an ideology that is it is an autotelic kind of thing it tells itself and it doesn't need anything that uh, moves out of the text so that is that and then you have advent of theory that is the arrival of theory and with theory which i talked about you know we have these three points that theory uh, uh brought the changes one is of course the primacy of language earlier you know uh, language was not given that much uh, primary uh, place in the study of uh, in the study of literature not, not even but in radical sense in which these uh, uh, 
uh, theorists, critical theorists, tried to bring it to. So you shall see, a language was, as I earlier said, revolutionized. It was uh, being understood in terms of something which doesn't give you meaning, which doesn't contain meaning, which has some very inverse kind of uh, relationship with reality that it lives with, and all those things. Then there was the termination of subject, that is the author. By subject, I mean the author uh, was being challenged. He was uh, literally eliminated from literary studies, and it did not remain the sanctified, codified literary study later on. It turned into a study which is open-ended and can be dealt with all kinds of possible approaches. So you have, there is a rejection of unity also. Unity was also being challenged in the sense that nothing was supposed to be united. Once uh, critical theorists had taken the stand that there was nothing stable, universal, unified, and universally applicable also, and meaningful, and that meaning cannot be determined, and that there was nothing determinable, in a way, a kind of nihilistic approach, then it was difficult for them to continue with this element of unity in text. So that was why they rejected the element of unity. It doesn't mean that they favored this unity, of course. We should not go to the other uh, extreme end because that will not help us. But then these were the three uh, things that uh, theory tried to bring into. And then you have uh, this you know, theory replacing criticism. What changed with theory? You have this in every synoptic form. Literature lost its stable, universal, valued, value-based institutionalized form. By the time literary, literary theory had taken over, you know, literature had lost its institutionalized form. By institution, we mean that it has its own apparatus, own, sep uh, own setup, own structure, where you have uh, uh, writers as creators and readers as receivers kind of thing, and meaning also works in between, and all those things. That is what I mean by institutionalization. Uh, some of you must gone through a book that uh, Raymond Williams wrote by the title Marxism and Literature, in which he talks about the origins of literature and how literature later on came to acquire the status of an institution. So it is in that sense that we have to understand that the institutionalized uh, stature of literature was being challenged by theory, and that literature did not become, uh, did not remain canonical anymore with the advent of theory no definite and determinable meaning, which I earlier talked about, challenge to the act of interpretation. This is one thing, you know, that they have been anti-interpretative or you can say misinterpretative, both terms used by Nietzsche in what he did earlier. You know. But mostly anti-interpretation, even though Harold Brown was on the side of misinterpretation while criticizing theorists, we should not move towards that. But theory by and large tried to debase, tried to uh, take away the, the foundations on which literary study was or criticism was based, you know. So criticism as a discipline, criticism as an institution, criticism as a practicing, exercising discipline was being challenged and all other things which were extra literary uh, were brought into literary studies. For example, philosophy was brought into, for example, uh, anthropology was brought into, for example, Claude Lévi-Strauss did that. Philosophy was brought into, psychology was brought into, for example, you have uh, Freud and Luca, and even Zizek, you can continue with that. So uh, you have uh, a lot many things, lot many issues which were being brought into the study of literature, which actually, if you go to the earlier critics, you know, for example, I. Richards and more uh, uh, F.R. Lewis, less I. Richards and more F.R. Lewis, you shall see that Lewis would not have allowed these kinds of uh, extra literary things to deal with literature. That I think is uh, self-explanatory, I need not go into that, but I'm just referring to, suggesting these were the changes, these were the things uh, rigorously and very forcefully brought into the study of literature by theorists. Next, we move on to uh, this slide, you know, and it is in a very circular form, you shall see where uh, you shall see how uh, theory has, this is what theory has branched into these days. Yes. Can you maximize it? Yeah. The slide? Yeah. Yes. It is maximized now? No, no. Fine. Okay. Uh, sir, 
there is a 16% okay, F5, press F5. Oh. No, no. It's okay. Sir. Ah. Ah, Prashant. At the down, there is a one option, slide show. No, no, this side. Yes. At the bottom. Is it this? Okay, increase the percentage now. Yes, yes, at the bottom. Ah. Fine. Okay, and now. No, it is still not. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. You can go ahead now. You can see it. Yes, yes, we can see no, I'm it. I'm sorry. But, yeah, it's okay. These are the such uh, technological glitches. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, so you can start with this. I can go to slideshow now. Yes, yes, sir. You can go with the slideshow, sir. This helps, na? Wait a minute. It's not visible yet. Wait a minute. Fine. Okay, it's okay. We can go with this. Continue with. Yes, yes, yeah. 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 We can go with this. And you know, at the top, we have class and ideology and culture. This is what theory has done with literature. Yes, uh, class was brought into the discussion of uh, theory. Ideology was brought. Culture was brought. This was with Marxist criticism, of course. And then there is something called new Marxism. This is the current position that we have of uh, the, the literary studies or what you call, I prefer to use the word because using it to be, uh, using it is very critical these days. So you have this, at present we are going through these kinds of, uh, uh, kinds of waves. You have class ideology and culture, which later on was uh, turned into new Marxism. Some of you must have heard uh, Frankfurt School of uh, Marxism, you know, Marxist critics, where you have Walter Benjamin and Theodor Adorno. We don't have time to go into the details, but then that is what they did. Ideology was brought into the consideration of literature. This was new Marxism. Then you have feminism, uh, which in a way can be understood as a direct result of feminism as a theory, as a direct result of new Marxism on one hand and critical theory on the other hand. So you have race and ethnicity and gender also because these three uh, factors have played vital role in the in the study of literature these days then you have new historicism and then uh, post colonialism chronologically you should have to adjust these things i am not bothered about chronology i am more bothered about how uh, theory has branched into these kinds of different uh, split versions you know then you have uh, queer theory which is having a lot of boom these days then you have culture studies, which is a burgeoning, burgeoning kind of a, a new emerging kind of field, which has still not settled itself. And then finally, we have come down to this issue called politics. Today, what we are bothered about when we study literature is that we are bothered about it's politically inclined to a particular uh, ideology to a say, particular discourse. So we have understood, we have uh, learned to understand literature from the point of view of politics in the sense whether it expresses a particular ideology, whether it leans to a particular ideology or uh, it resists a particular ideology. And this is obvious, of course, because we have entered into a world where these kinds of uh, things are going to uh, influence the study of literature. So you can very easily see that we have moved away from the study of literature in its original form as a construction, uh, as a composition, as a, as, as a composition in imaginative composition or creative composition towards a linguistic construction, towards a construction of political ideology. This is what I think the, uh, the vista that we have, the panorama on which it sits. And then next we turn towards uh, this 
the is theory dead now the answer is to an extent yes because it is no more in its prime it had an enjo enjoyed its uh, heyday in 1970s and 80s and now it is not doing so that is obvious and if you are a champion of uh, literary theory fine then you can come out with a defense if you are a critic of uh, literary theory fine again you have your own say but this is uh, this we have to understand and accept with no reservations whatsoever that uh, critical theory has lost its heyday its prime time it is not the prime time which wage and this is uh, uh, this has been uh, uh, this has been voiced articulated by by the theorists no less of uh, class and caliber like uh, theory egalton so even theorists announced its death its defenders and opponents what caused the decline of uh, high theory well uh, these are some of the reasons you know why theory uh, is not that effective today so theory has taken on different uh, different roots different uh, versions in the 21st century one reason is that it was it has been charged with its exclusive focus on textuality so that it has been uh, exclusive in the sense that it has excluded non textual issues the same question which was raised about the political position of both barts and foucault and derrida uh, we do not have time to go into but then the reference is uh, in a fighting that the theorists did not according to the according to their critics uh, did not explain their political inclinations so they focused on textuality and naturally they did not bother about the things that surrounded them the result was that uh, other theories or other versions of uh, theories took over them then you have uh, that uh, theory has been self reflexive that it refers to itself and it doesn't go out of itself that is another reason its inability to catch up with socio political of uh, excess focus on language as a system isolated from its world that is another reason why uh, it it continued to lose its hold over literary studies and the last one is very important the resurgence of political discourses uh, and what these political discourses are follows in the uh, next slides you know you have this as with theory extra literary uh, concerns replaced literary studies this is again what uh, theory or literary studies will take on now we shall move towards the last part of our discussion and that is what should be the future of what will be the future of should be would be a kind of obligation but then we can say what will be the future of uh, theory um i believe uh, it will be like this that it will exclusively focus on these these parameters which i have tried to draw before you it is politics and this is very paramount because it covers most of the things Uh, for example it covers race and gender and class and ethnicity and language and identity and immigration and all these can be uh, dealt with in detailed way you know and then uh, international affairs also these days we are going through very hot conditions because of the pandemic and other issues so international affairs are going to have serious influence over the study of literature then the next will be culture with politics we move on to the culture you know and culture uh, i think i think i need not go into the details of what culture studies are then next will be economy and for those who are interested uh, in knowing how economy is going to affect the study of literature in the future perhaps would be this book will be very useful to them this is a companion to literature and economics edited by sebet and michel china uh, that is in 2018 this is a routledge companion and it uh, ties up it is an authoritative guide of course which ties uh, the seemingly disparate opposite uh, fields like literature and economics let us not say literature as a discipline now let us say it as a field because we have moved away from discipline to field so it's a speculating field that is what mapping field and speculating its future that is what i have uh, given the title of my presentation you know with this awareness that we have moved into 21st century where there is nothing like discipline and there is nothing like 
unity and universalization and stability and truth and anything of that sort. And I think uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, is unfortunately proving this to be true, that there is nothing stable and strong and permanent. Thanks anyway to critical theorists for having foreshadowed this kind of uh, pandemic, you know, in literary studies. So that is it. Migration is another uh, issue I, I believe uh, will be very important and will be influencing the study of literature in the coming future. So my point is the, the important issues which are very significant in the study of literature in the 2020 20 are likely to be replaced by these concerns, these topics, you know. We will be uh, studying economy and politics and culture and migration and uh, culture studies and all those things, you know. Pro or con, of course, for, for or against. You can go to one side or to the other side. Polar, polar opposites are there, but then there will be the uh, clashes and quarrels of this sort, which will be out of the text and not within the text. And that is where I think uh, theory has unfortunately fallen short of and that uh, theory has been taken over by uh, other concerns, you know. In, in migration, you have this wonderful book, which unfortunately I could not read the whole anyway, but I, I half of that I read and I found it to be very wonderful. Return of migration, return of migration and psychological well being, this course is policy making and outcomes for migrants and their families. This was published in 2017, and this has a direct relevance to the kind of unfortunate plight that we have been with due to the COVID-19, you know, this has a direct reference to that as well. Of course, they did not mention COVID because that was not there, but then that talks about the problem of migration and all those things. Fine then, this is, uh, these are some of the areas I am, I believe will certainly influence the study of literature. Next will be uh, this one. Environment will be another uh, kind of thing that we should be bothered about, you know. And again, you have a environment, environment criticism that was in 2005, and some of you might be knowing. Those who are interested in eco criticism and something of that sort would probably find this book to be a wonderful one. So, environment is going to be ecological concerns are there, but there are other concerns as well that we have to take into account, and how literature tries to express or reflect these concerns in itself uh, will turn out to be the focus of the study of uh, literature, you know, in the coming future. Next, you have psychology also, such stuff as dreams, the psychology of fiction. This is also a wonderful book uh, that was published in 2011 and something that I've written that is from the book itself, you know. Th these lines are from the book itself and you can immediately understand how this is an on the part of the writers that they can take literature back to the, the uh, Joyce's, what you call the pleasure, reading of literature as a pleasure. That was what Barthes was saying earlier, reading of literature as a pleasure kind of fact, a pleasant kind of activity. So uh, creation, writing of literature and reading of literature should turn out to be a kind of pleasure, you know, with, uh, ad with added shade of experiences. That is what they have argued. I'm doubtful whether this kind of, especially about this book, even though it is wonderful and it's a wonderful read as well, but I'm doubtful whether we shall be having, uh, we shall be able to find pleasure and uh, insights at the same time, uh, reading literature in the future. You know. Given the earlier, uh, earlier influences, politics and culture and all those things, you know, it is going to be uh, very difficult to do so. And finally, you have digitization. And this has been a lot of booming kind of thing, you know, uh, what it has done called Digital Humanities and all that, something like hypertext. There is a wonderful book by George P. Lando by the same title, The Critical Theory and uh, Hypertext, you know, in which he talks about how important. That was, of course, in 19, uh, 1990s, perhaps, the book that was written. But uh, that will also help you to understand how uh, the study of literature has been moving from its earlier uh, concerns to us, the contemporary concerns. Uh, I shall wind up with a few uh, concluding comments about what I think about the study of literature you know, in the coming future. This, please do not take these to be predictions. Uh, that is, I do not mean to say that this is what exactly going to happen in the future. This is what 
uh, I think are going to be the concerns that literature will be dealing with, or the students of literature will be dealing with. Uh, one thing is good that, ha that has been happening these days, and it is this that we are moving away from what was exclusively supposed to be the literary towards extra literary. And we should not uh, we should not take it as take it the otherwise that is a a, a reverse kind of uh, thing you know in a negative sense. If we are moving from literature towards extra literary concerns, that is fine because we are moving into the world of interdisciplinarity. So this has been lost. Uh, I'm using the word unfortunately because I am a hard teacher, and a teacher always feels very bad if you would get out of the uh, confined area but uh, given the present context you know we have to understand and learn to live with the inter interdisciplinarity second thing that uh, is very important about the study of literature is and i am using deliberately the word study of literature i'm using neither criticism nor theory because they will be of no more use in the future as well these will be the uh, the cornerstones the buzzwords in the coming future you know in the 21st century you have digitization and economy and migration and culture studies and culture and identity and politics and whatnot. All these concerns will be looming very large over literature in the 21st century. So uh, it is good that we have moved away from and I think we are moving towards, if I'm not making a value statement, we shall be moving towards a kind of holistic approach towards the study of literature in the coming future. Uh, development of criticism from New criticism to Dr. Prashant. Yes, sir. Um, is it time now for me to stop? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How much uh, more time you need? No, I, I think uh, I need a lot of time anyway, but <laughs> we may not be able to cover up everything. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, fine. I think uh, okay. I was able in some way to share what I thought about uh, Thank you, sir. literature and criticism and theory. And I hope this will help uh, students and scholars and teachers also. But let me uh, conclude with this comment, uh, Prashant, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Uh, my co-panelist Trivedi sir will also agree with me okay, that teachers will find it to be a very hard time in 21st century teaching into the classrooms because uh, as far as the pedagogy is concerned, you know, it has been brought into the sphere called critical thinking. We are in the world of critical thinking. We have to revise, re-innovate, redefine, reinterpret our uh, our policies of teaching. You know, not because we have uh, we we are going to adopt distance mode of learning like this one, which uh, you have initiated. Not simply for that reason, but for the reason that literature is uh, is uh, losing its conventional slough very fast and entering into the world which was not meant for it. Literature is doing with so something called fiction and non-fiction, imaginative and non-imaginative, creative and non-creative, non-economical and economical, literary and non-literary. These kinds of uh, differences have collapsed and then we have to readjust ourselves uh, or resituate ourselves into the world that post theory has created for us. So it's a hard time for teachers and uh, students both because uh, no more we have the luxury of, of uh, dipping and stepping into literary texts and trying to find out their beauties. I would love to do that. Every good teacher will do that, you know. He or she will love to go into the text and uh, explain to us the beauties of that. But then that is what we have to do. Fine, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request you to stop the sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. sir, kindly click on Q and A box. There are certain questions for you. Are you there, Sandhya Jain, ma'am? So we have with us Dr. Umesh Zardai, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. My goodness, sir. Are you there? Am I audible, sir? 
Yes, 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 you are. You are. Ah, uh, very good afternoon, sir. Uh, yes. I'm Pai Gon Day. Uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, you have arranged Dr. Kulkarni sir's lecture. It has been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, I am a student of him. I was uh, studying there in IIC. So uh, at that time, this was very new for me, and uh, it was very difficult for under, uh, uh, very difficult for me to understand. But uh, to sir, it was a very delighted experience, and I was missing him from the last so many days. And Thank you, thank you, Pai Gundi, sir. I think there is a range problem with uh, this mobile, the internet connectivity problem. Sir, Triviti, sir, there are a few questions for you. Kindly click okay. in Q&A box. Right. Okay, you can take your questions. I think quickly we can... Yes, quickly. Uh, one by one. A few. Is that very first question which says, uh, does Hamlet believe that the ghost of Piers was his father's? If he does, uh, why he delayed to kill his uncle who killed his father? Well, uh, that's what the tragedy is all about. Uh, delay is absolutely uh, there in the context. There is no doubt about it. And that would happen to any normal human being. Uh, because uh, as I said, the very opening of the drama has the appearance of spirit, something eerie appears, right? And that's not something that everyone, everyone would trust upon, including uh, the son, Hamlet. Uh, there were peculiar doubts in his mind and uh, time by time as the ghost appears and keeps reminding him that, remember me, remember me, when these dialogues, they keep coming to his mind. Uh, you must have seen the film, recent uh, cinema, that was uh, Haider, uh, which was rather a Hindi adaptation of uh, Hamlet. Hamlet, wonderfully conducted that cinema. Because of course, uh, the character of Rudar, played by late Irfan Khan, uh, was that of a messenger, which was unlike the text. In the text, the literal appearance or the very vision of the ghost appears in, in the shape of the late King Hamlet. Uh, but then the people who saw did have their own genuine questions. And uh, you must have observed in the, in the previous discussion wherein I, I did enlist that uh, Horatio, being a scholar, did not immediately you know, accept it that uh, that, that must be the ghost. He kept on asking questions. And when his faith was shaken, you know, he said that, no, 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 no. I mean, I'll, I'll stand in front of the ghost and I'll cross the ghost uh, and will pose as cross, the, the cross that of Christianity. So, uh, yes, they were horrified, uh, including Hamlet, of course, because Hamlet was curious whether that ghost is that of his father or not, whether he'll have a revisit of his father's ghost or not. He was in continuous doubt. And once he reaches to the very core element of his action, wherein he is supposed to take the, the very idea of action into practice, he does attempt so. But then it, it takes time because uh, he's educated. I did, uh, I did include that part also into discussion that he was not anyone random and he wasn't unlike the earlier version, the Danish version, which I talked about that of Chronicle, right? There is a very, you know, mysterious dialogue between the father and the son, which remains between them. The ghost does not reveal everything to the rest of the people, perhaps the ones who had happened to see the ghost. It talks to the son only. And the son happens to remain in dilemma because he doesn't know whether the god is that of his late father or that could be some goblin, that could be some, some conspiracy, that could be any kind of appearance because there is constant gloom around. 
So to create the mystery, to create the horror, and to make sure that delay turns out to be one of the reasons of decay, uh, you know, Shakespeare has quite tactfully uh, consumed some amount of time to make sure that Hamlet doesn't reach to conclusion immediately. And by that way, probably he was highly realistic, though bringing in the character of a spirit or a ghost would call for rather an imaginative mindset. But often, as we know, I mean, the way we, we often convey that imagination is, is sometimes more closer to reality. It was something like that. So I, I consider this as valid. Yes, sir. We can move on to the second question. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is another question which says, what's your opinion about Shakespeare, Shakespeare's notion of poetic justice? Well, uh, remember that it's a drama. Uh, it's not meant to preach. Uh, there may be other byproducts, but then uh, Hamlet is a drama, an exclusive case, uh, a wonderful inquiry into human mind it is. And uh, obviously, it can take you into any direction. So poetic justice is obviously something that, that does take place, but that can have results of any kind. So uh, uh, one should be prepared for uh, the poetic justice of its own kind. I think Shakespeare did justify it by this drama. And uh, I think there is another question I, uh, I would pick. Yes. Uh, what is a folio version and quarto version? Uh, some participant has posted. Pooja Polkar has asked this question. Well, these are the, the two huge, you know, copies that store or preserve uh, multiple manuscripts of uh, Shakespeare. Right. And these two versions, they are often taken up as references, as original texts. But then there are few either typological or some other kind of, you can say, uh, distinctions between uh, the versions that are enlisted in both the, uh, both the prints. These are prints actually, and they are identified based on these two titles, folio version as well as quarto version. So Can we have with us Dr. Nidhi Joshi, ma'am. Are you there? Hello. Are you there, Dr. Nidhi Joshi? Okay, sir. Still, she connects. So we can move further. Uh, of course, of course. Other questions. I think there are scattered questions. I, I, I believe the part yeah. here. Uh, would someone like to ask? Yes, sir. The questions are scattered. So if, if, if you could uh, pose me a question. Uh, I think there are, uh, there is one question for Kulkarni sir. Mm -hmm. How far do you agree with the author is date technique in practical criticism? How far the author how is far, dead? Uh, yes. How far do you agree with the author is date in practical criticism? This is a question by uh, one of the research scholars. Uh, question is uh, wrongly framed. I'm sorry for that. Yes, yes. For a very simple reason that practical criticism has nothing to do with the writer right. in the first place, because practical criticism was uh, was something which was uh, made popular by A. Richards and some of the Cambridge uh, critics, you know, yes. and they did not believe in uh, the author. What new criticism later on did. But of course, uh, author has a very significant role to play. This is a side. I'm sorry, I shall enter into Dr. Trivedi's world yes, yes, of yes. drama, and I would say this is an aside. I'm sorry for that. But then <laughs> that is that, you know, that we have to understand that the writer has to have a particular role because you can raise a very simple question taking up with what uh, Dr. Trivedi uh, elaborated, you know. What will you do with Shakespeare? If you take Shakespeare out of the texts, what remains in the text? You can have a very valid kind of question of this thought. You can raise these kinds of questions. My, my uh, 
way of saying is the way i would like to see uh, you to see at it is that we should be able to look at literature and theory through a very proper perspective it is a question of perspective theories raise questions they do not provide us answers that is one thing that we have to understand by taking out the element of writer from literary studies what happens is what we have to understand so this is more interrogatory and less prescriptive that is what i think huh? we have to understand this if you eliminate the writer from the text what happens is what happens to the text then that is the concept yeah that is what these are the basics actually these are the basics yes. the text the reader the the writer and the world are the basic things and abrams in the uh, in one of his books you know in the he he has uh, delineated depicted these kinds of things in a very elaborate fashion so we have to understand these basic things the point yeah. is we have to understand the perspective through which uh, we can look at it you so right. uh, it's not a question of i subscribing it yes yes i'm sorry for that i do not yes. subscribe it nor do i reject it entirely yeah it's not a question of you cannot have a yes and no kind of uh, uh, answer for this yes so there is a question uh, again there is a question for dr kulkarni sir yeah. by sachin bagul where do you locate rhetorical theory in the mapping literary theory uh rhetoric uh, you know all reader response theories are rhetorical in fact all theories which go towards raising questions about the study of literature from the reader point of view you know are are all rhetorical uh, you have two things that we you have to understand you have rhetoricity on one hand and grammar on the other hand so when you go by grammatical ways of looking at literature you have a different set of theories when you go for rhetoricity you have different all uh, critical theories are rhetorical in a way if you if you allow me to make a sweeping statement of this kind barring some exceptions of course <laughs> but then they are all of them are rhetorical say for example uh, foucault's uh, theory about discourse or foucault's theory about power and knowledge is nothing else if it is not rhetorical that is it sir there is one question for dr trividi sir in the chat box can you throw some light on the relevance of the study of shakespeare in the present era well he is uh, treated as somebody with uh, universal elements to explore in, uh, that itself is uh, something that that confuses the very the very aspect that everything that turns out to be human in terms of either tendency or approach or in terms of character is well explored by shakespeare and that that those elements are basically timeless elements so yes as i i mean in the earlier uh, response only i said that uh, it's adaptation in in, in hindi had you know that that cinematic presentation itself had very convincing you know note of uh, uh, relation you can literally see those characters you can easily identify those characters though they may be hindi ones that here you have horatio here you have uh, hamlet's uncle right you you can easily identify so, so universality and of course uh, the the time uh, they remain constant as far as his uh, studies are concerned shakespearean studies exclusively are concerned and that's why you have uh, scholars across the continent who, who keep reading his texts in multiple uh, uh, you know modes of inquiry and and and, and it's still going on yes that would be all from my side i mean it, yes. it's endless yes yes and nikhil kumar do you have any question yes sir yes उट न्यूक्रिटिज 
एफआर लिवेज ही एक्सक्लूडेड चार्ल्स डिकेंस इन इन द लाइन ऑफ ग्रेट नॉवलिस्ट सो व्हाई डिड ही एक्सक्लूड चार्ल्स डिकेंस दैट वाज द माय क्वेश्चन ओके थैंक यू हां सर दिस इज बिकॉज एफआर लिवेज वाज राइटिंग अ बुक विथ विथ with the agenda or the program of exclusion one very straightforward answer that you can give is this that fr levis was writing the book the great tradition with a program or an agenda of exclusion it was excluded you know so that is how you you have to go by you know levis continues with the legacy of anold anold uh, always supported high culture so also fr levis did that and you have so many in between uh, the great critics you know so the re- reason why he uh, excluded was this that it was clearly ideological it was clearly ideological thank you sir yeah. are you there diksha kadam ma'am right sir thank you sir are you there the dr diksha kadam mega mishra ma'am i think we are done with the questions uh, dr kalyani dikshit ma'am uh, first of all i would like to say that uh, both the sessions were very very informative and both the speakers were uh, very very learned and they expressed their ideas uh, you know in a very very nice way Uh, as far as Dr. Deep Kumar J. Prevedi is concerned, his views are very nice, very precious for us. And he said that Shakespeare was uh, not a strict believer in religion. Uh, it's a. Uh, I welcome his thought. And, uh, the statement from uh, Hamlet that "Avenge my death" is not theologically accepted it is also uh, uh, very nice, and we uh, agree with you, sir. and uh, uh, shakespeare's original manuscripts are not available we all know that as far as dr trivedi's views are concerned shakespeare and his uh, machinery of host is really very very commendable and uh, uh, he expressed his views very explicitly and his uh, session was really very informative thank you so much to you sir thank you mr anand kulkarni ji uh, 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 Anil Kulkarni ji's session is concerned. Uh, his views on criticism uh, are also very nice. In 20th century, he said that in 20th century uh, there is nothing like discipline. There is nothing like uh, stability. I agree with you, sir. Uh, he also recommended some books to us, and uh, he said that environment is something that uh, should be bothered about. Yes, yeah, sir. We also agree with you. he talked about the ecological textual psychological concerns of the literature and he also talked about digitization um, about which he said that digitization is a booming kind of thing yes sir we agree with you thank you so much sir for such an informative and nice session thank you so much sir. thank you thank you very much uh, dikshit ma'am uh, wait a minute i think there is a- we are done with the questions sir yeah, okay fine i think let me check okay Th- thank you very much dr deep kumar trivedi sir dr anand kulkarni sir for yes. your thought provoking informative insightful and interactive sessions on shakespeare's hamlet the the history the anthropology and the theater and a uh, criticism contra theory mapping the field and speculating its future respectively we uh, thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot from your session thank you very much one and all for your active participation by logging zoom room full uh, all the time and those who are watching on youtube channel and made this lecture series a grand grand success let's learn and learn and relearn together it's another uh, thought provoking and stimulating uh, learning together langley lectures theory uh, series believe in the philosophy to learn from each other grow together and spread happiness be safe happy and healthy thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you thank you much sir